This is Neef Talks. This whole thing really started back in 2009 time frame. That's when various companies got, got word that this was about to happen, including Boeing. And so we actually set up a, a small team. There were about a dozen of us that uh, started with our initial design for the Boeing uh, Starliner program. That led uh, by NASA to about 2012, when NASA let out contracts to three different companies um, to, to, to pursue this, and then they were going to down-select from there. And that down-select took place in 2014, when, uh, when NASA selected both SpaceX and Boeing, SpaceX with their Crew Dragon, Boeing with the Starliner. So this was the first time Atlas actually launched uh, our capsule. You can see uh, in the pictures there. Um, Atlas V getting ready in the uh, vertical um, vehicle facility. The launch itself was, was uh, very successful. Um, so again, the first time they had launched our, our spacecraft. After we uh, executed a main engine cutoff and then separated from the vehicle, uh, Mike's guidance software went off to compute uh, the first burn. And this turned out to be a, a pretty big software glitch that we had to deal with in mission control. And what happened was, um, instead of converging on a solution for that burn, um, it didn't come up with a solution. Turns out it wasn't Mike's fault, but it was another software problem, really just one line of code, of, uh, of not getting uh, the time updated properly on our spacecraft, the time of launch itself. And so uh, we have protections in place uh, throughout our guidance, nav and control, but especially in the guidance code, protections in place that do sanity checks on the numbers it's, it's crunching. And if those numbers don't look right, instead of coming up with an erroneous answer, it says, I'm not going to give you an answer. Better do nothing than do, than do the wrong thing. So that's really what happened here. Um, the code itself um, said, I'm not going to give you an answer right now. We discovered real quickly in Mission Control what had happened. Now, we have backups to backups to backups on this program. The backup to this is that we, we do a canned maneuver instead of a, instead of a real-time computed um, burn itself based on the actual orbital, uh, suborbital condition, we, we send up a, a canned maneuver itself. Unfortunately, this our day, um, we got the maneuver, we got the, um, the Delta V shipped up to the vehicle, and when we sent the command up to execute that, we lost contact with the vehicle. Turned out our spacecraft was in uh, not a very good attitude, and so in terms of antenna line of sight to the TDRS satellite system. And so it, um, it, it took a period of time. Now normally we want to do this burn at the high point or the apogee. Um, at this point in time we had actually crossed apogee. And so um, eventually we did get that burn up to it and it did the burn and it went orbital and we were good to go. So anyway, um, because of that it was not the most efficient burn. We used more propellant than we expected. And as a result, um, it was questionable whether we had enough propellant to go dock with the space station and then come home. Well, from a priority standpoint, it was more important to get our vehicle home than to demonstrate rendezvous and docking. Uh, extremely disappointed that we didn't do the rendezvous and docking, um, but the good news is we're, we were able to do that do orbit burn and get the vehicle home, and it land, landed at White Sands Space Harbor. Um, Obviously, the software worked to get us into orbit. We put a lot of attention into that, make sure we didn't repeat that same problem. But because OFT itself didn't get us to space station, we Boeing actually paid for the for a next test flight before we actually put crew on board. We delivered 500 pounds of cargo to the space station and 500 pounds back, and so that was a very successful mission. All right, let's talk about crew flight test. All right, so this is the first time we flew crew on the vehicle. As I mentioned, they launched on June the 5th, and uh, there are actually two issues that we, we had with the thruster system. The first issue was with a, a leak of helium. Helium itself is not the propellant that, that, that the thrusters use. Helium itself is a pressurant that pushes the, the fuel and oxidizer into the combustor for combustion and, and so on. We had a very, very, very slight helium leak that was detected pre-launch. Um, in fact, it was so small that we felt it was safe to fly. NASA said it was safe to fly, and so uh, that did not stop us from launching. Um, 
that helium leak, and there were some others, there was more than one, were all extremely small and took place actually that whole time uh, until we got docked. Once we got docked, we closed the valves, there was no leak, and then we reopened, came home, and leak was really never a problem. The bigger problem was with the thrusters themselves. Um, everything worked fine on flight day one. On flight day two, um, not at the beginning of flight day two, when, but when we got closer to the space station, uh, we had some thrusters that, that started to die on us. Now the good news is we have 28 uh, reaction control system thrusters. We have 20 uh, larger thrusters that we can do rendezvous with. And then this is separate from the 12 thrusters that are on the crew module that are needed for entry, descent, and landing. But nonetheless, this is not a, a good situation when you start having these RCS thrusters fail. And so when we got up to the approach corridor, uh, we were still a, a safe distance from station. Um, we did a, a stop at that point in time, which was part of the plan to begin with, uh, to give Butch and Sonny a chance to, to test fly that, the, the, the control system now that they're on the corridor and they're only an uh, uh, hour and a half away from docking. They tested all that um, and things were looking up and then we lost a couple more thrusters and so we said, Butch, let's just uh, let the vehicle coast right now. We're not in a big hurry. Um, what the crew has on board in terms of data and displays is really just a subset of what we have on the ground. We're constantly streaming um, lots and lots of data. We have, I've got like five displays in front of me, others do as well, where, where we have um, a great deal of information and we had uh, really characterized those, those, those five failed thrusters as being a, a thermal issue on the ground. And so, um, on the ground, we, we sent uh, uh, commands up to the spacecraft itself to each of those five thrusters in order to uh, recover them. Of those five thrusters, four were, were brought back. One of them uh, was failed and was failed for the rest of the mission. And so, of the 28 thrusters we had, which is normally what we call two fault tolerant, you can lose any two and you can still fly. Of those 28 thrusters, we had 27 good thrusters that we could fly with. And so we decided um, on our side, on the Boeing side, we had serious discussions with NASA, space station program, everybody was in agreement, let's go ahead and press ahead to docking. And in fact, that's what we did. And so we pressed ahead, the 27 thrusters were, were just fine. We docked, everything was good. After we docked, um, there's a serious issue. This is not something we take lightly. But after we docked, we spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, analyzing more of the data, we did ground tests of thrusters, we had meetings on a daily basis between Boeing and NASA, as well as Aerojet Rocketdyne. The thrusters themselves, actually, Boeing doesn't make thrusters, we buy them from other companies. Aerojet Rocketdyne is, uh, has been around for decades. Uh, they built the thrusters on the shuttle, they built the thrusters for our vehicle, and so they were really good about joining in and, and really uncovering what's going on here with these thrusters. And, um, and so we, we had drawn the conclusion that this was a thermal issue on those thrusters. But to make sure it would be a safe return for the crew, we went ahead and did uh, additional th firings of all 27 thrusters while we, were, while we were docked to station. And all 27 thrusters worked well. They had cooled off in the meantime, and we were good to go. Um, Nonetheless, in discussions with NASA, while Boeing, we, we, we concluded we could bring the crew home. NASA had another option available to it, and that was, uh, rather than bring the crew home on our spacecraft, there was an upcoming uh, Crew Dragon with, with a crew of four on board. Um, instead of sending all four, they would just send two up, and then Butch and Sonny would be the other two to make up that complement of four for the next six months. And, and then those would be the astronauts for that, that crew rotation, and then all four of them would come home. And so um, NASA said, since we have this, this really good option, and, and Butch and Sonny are real life astronauts, they're not tourists. They, um, in fact, they had both done tours of duty on station before, so they knew what to do. Um, so NASA decided to keep them up there until February of this year. February turned into March until uh, Dragon was ready 
to be launched and bring the crew home. And then the crew came home uh, back on March uh, 18th, last month. So um, we're all happy for Butch and Sonny, obviously. By the way, uh, having worked with Butch and Sonny, uh, NASA could not have picked two better astronauts to, uh, to take care of that situation that went on, on on board. So, all right, we've got time for questions. Anyone in the audience? Yes, over here. Uh, that's a good question. As far as we know, yes. Um, uh, it hasn't been determined by NASA exactly what flights will take place in the future. I could only speculate, you know, that maybe if we had a couple of flights next year and then one flight per year after that, um, the last flight would be in 2030. But, uh, but no, we're, we're still working the contract, assuming the same thing that we signed years ago back in 2014. All right, thank you very much.